Before I can explain the invention, I need to explain the new way of understanding involute gearing that I discovered. It turns out that all involute gearing is based on a simple three-dimensional shape, and that the enigmatic involute curve that has haunted students for centuries is no more than a cross-section of this very simple three-dimensional shape. Let's start at the beginning. Here we see a simple triangle. The vertical and horizontal lines are at right angles to each other and are of length 2 times pi. But actually it's a diagonal line that is the really important one, as you will see later. Now let's add an identical triangle to the first one and align it with the vertical line of the first triangle. Next we fold this second triangle into a cylinder. Now let's see how this looks from above. Notice that as the length of the horizontal line was 2 times pi, the radius of the cylinder is therefore 1. Now we add many more triangles like the first one, but we adjust the size of each new triangle to match the height of the cylinder at that position. Next we repeat this an infinite amount of times. This creates a solid shape. We call this shape the 3D involute shape. Here we see an animation of the 3D involute shape rotating around its center. So basically the 3D involute shape is nothing more than a straight line spiraling up. Now let's look at the 3D involute shape from above. You will probably recognize this shape as the two-dimensional involute curve. Historically, this curve has been the basis of all involute gearing. And there is a mathematical formula that describes this curve, but mathematically speaking, this formula is an absolute dragon. It might seem the obvious starting point for those seeking new insights into involute gearing, but this formula is very much a dead end. However, we now have our 3D involute shape and this very difficult two-dimensional involute curve is actually no more than a vertical cross-section of our very easy to understand three-dimensional 3D involute shape. In fact, at whatever vertical height we take the cross-section, the result is always exactly the same involute curve, be it a bit rotated around its center. And as the vertical and horizontal lines are of length 2 times pi, the amount of rotation in radians is equal to the difference in height. And interestingly, in the cross-sections, the length of the diagonal line projections onto the cross-section are also the difference in height. So these three variables are all the same value. This allows for some great maths. But you will be happy to hear that we will not be doing any of that in this video. Instead, we go back to our 3D involute shape. We zoom in a bit and delete most of our 3D involute shape. Let's zoom in a little bit more. And now let's look at it from the side. There is not much left of our 3D involute shape, but it is important to realize that even in this small bit, all the characteristics of the 3D involute shape remain. Next, we take our little piece and mirror it on itself, and then copy the result of this mirroring six times around. And, you can't see it in the figures, but in order for it to intermesh with other gears, it is a good idea to scale everything up by the number of teeth. Notice that we are now using the number of teeth as a unit of length. This too makes the maths a lot easier. Back to our figure. We now have the basic mathematical shape of a conical involute gear with six teeth. Now let's make it into a real gear by adding some material in between the gaps. The resulting conical involute gear is also known as a bevloid or tapered gear. This type of gear is hardly ever used, so very little research has been done on it. So you might think that this gear type is unimportant. But actually this gear type is the basis of all involute gears. This is because any cross-section of these gears results in a two-dimensional shape that forms the basis of all involute gears. Let me explain. As scaling and the number of teeth are mostly constants, we can ignore these. So only the factor of the height of the cross-section remains. And this factor alone therefore determines almost everything in involute gearing, like the distance between the axis of intermeshing gears, as well as the so-called pressure angle. This is a whole new way of looking at involute gearing. Now let's go back to our figure of a conical involute gear. You will remember that at the beginning of this video, I said that it was the diagonal line that was the really important line of the triangle. And all the lines in the figure that you see drawn on the two faces of the conical involute gear are copies of this diagonal line. So when two conical involute gears intermesh with each other, it are the copies of these diagonal lines that form the contact area between the intermeshing gears. So all the intermeshing is actually done by two perfectly straight lines pressing against each other. And if there is some backlash, sometimes also referred to as play between the teeth, it makes no difference, as this only results in two other copies of the diagonal lines pressing against each other. This is what makes involute gearing so forgiving and so strong. Here we see a wireframe presentation of two conical involute gears intermeshing. Notice the diagonal lines between the cylinders. These diagonal lines are the planes of contact. 
and the intermeshing between gears always takes place exactly on these planes of contact. You will notice that the diagonal lines of the conical involute gears are always exactly lined up with these planes of contact at the moment of intermeshing. Now the gear on the left has 8 teeth and it is the top gear in the main gear of the prototype. Normally a gear with 8 teeth would suffer terribly from undercutting, but as you can see this is not the case. This is due to the large central pressure angle used in the invention. By the way, the invention sits on a myriad of sweet spots. And on our website there is a separate video for each intermeshing stage of the invention. These videos are a great way for better understanding every detail of the invention. Conical involute gears intermesh with each other with their axes parallel and with their conical points pointing in opposite directions. And theoretically, only this way is correct. That might surprise some of you. As virtually all practical use of conical involute gears so far is therefore theoretically incorrect. Finally, on conical involute gears. One way of looking at two conical involute gears intermeshing with each other is to imagine a line in between two cylinders moving upwards at a constant rate. It really is that simple. Now let's explain the invention. As it is the height of the cross section that determines the distance at which two conical involute gears intermesh with each other, we can change this distance by simply sliding the gears over each other vertically. This is a unique trick that conical involute gears can do. We can also do another cool trick. By varying the height of the cross section we can create two gears, one of which has two teeth more than the other, that both intermesh with another gear at the same distance between the axes. If we then cut these two gears in half and then combine the two halves into a new gear, we get a gear which has an extra tooth in its bottom half. And when this gear intermeshes with another gear, the gear ratio continuously cycles between the gear ratios of the top and bottom half. I call this a multi-ratio gear and it's an integral part of the invention. This animation shows a spur gear version of the multi-ratio gear in action. Now the invention has a main gear which is comprised of many conical involute gears stacked on top of each other. Each next conical involute gear with two more teeth than the latter. And also of these conical involute gears with 180 degrees of the top and bottom halves cut off. So the middle parts of these conical involute gears function as normal single ratio gears while the top and bottom parts function as multi-ratio gears. With this setup, an intermeshing gear can slide vertically from one single ratio gear to the next by using the multi-ratio gears as intermediate stages between the single ratio gears. This solves the inherent problem normally associated with multi-speed transmissions. For by simply never disengaging, the phase and sync problem simply does not exist. Finally, we look at an animation to see how it all works. We see the main gear in the middle with an input and an output gear on either side. The blue conical gear at the top of the main gear has 8 teeth. The next conical gear in bronze color has 2 more teeth and so on. We see the purple gear slide from the top of the blue gear to the bottom of the blue gear. Once there it waits until it intermeshes with the bronze gear that has 10 teeth. Just after it intermeshes with the bronze gear it slides further down to the middle of the bronze gear. At this position it is intermeshing with a single ratio gear that has 10 teeth and the gear ratio is fixed. Next it does the whole movement in reverse until it's back at the top of the blue gear. And in this position the gear ratio is once again fixed but now with two teeth less. So basically the two gears on either side can move to any position and in the prototype this results in 59 unique gear ratios. And with gear ratios ranging from 1 to 1 to 1 to 9. And finally, most importantly, please give this video a like.